When the plane had come and gone, it had put him down, gutted him, and dropped him, and left him with nothing. They are referring to, or the author, Gary Paulson, is referring to that Brian is in some type of depression because the plane did not see him. The rest of that first day, he had gone down and down until dark, until nighttime. He had let the fire go out. He even forgot to eat an egg, and he let his brain take him down to where he was done, where he wanted to be done. Brian has feeling at this point like he has nothing to live for. If that plane did not see him, he is thinking that a plane, that was the one and only plane and it had come so far off the original course and that the searchers were probably giving up so that he is kind of in a stage in his life where, or in this journey where he is giving up. With his eyes closed and his mind open, he lay on the rock through the night. He lay there and he hated and he wished for it all to end. And the thought, one word, cloud down, cloud down came through his mind throughout the night, over and over that word, wanting all his clouds to come down. But in the morning, he was still there. So he didn't even go back to his shelter at all that night. That's why the fire went out. That's why he didn't eat the egg. Where he was when he saw that plane, he stayed there and he stayed there all through the night. He slept there and then he woke up the next morning. He called himself that first five days, the old Brian. The old Brian was weak. And two new things came into his mind, two true things. He was not the same. The plain passing had changed him. The disappointment cut him down and made him new. And that kind of refers back to the, the um, paragraph where I read that the old Brian had died and the new Brian had been born. He was not the same and would never be again like he had been. That was one of the true things, the new things. And the other one was that he would not die. He was new. Of course, he had made a lot of mistakes. He smiled now, walking up the lake shore after the wolves were gone, thinking of the early mistakes, the mistakes that came before he realized that he had to find new ways to be what he had become. So now we're kind of going to flash back to where we had left off and learn about all the things that Brian has learned while he has been in the forest for these 47 days. He had made a new fire, which he now kept going using partially rotten wood because the other wood would smolder for many hours and still, it come, would come back with fire. But that had been the extent of doing things right for a while. His first bow was a disaster that almost blinded him. He had sat a whole night and shaped the limbs carefully until the bow looked beautiful. Then, he had spent two days making arrows the shafts were willow trees, straight and with the bark peeled, and he had fire hardened them, the points, and he had split a couple of them to make forked points like he had done on his spear. He had no feathers, so he just left them bare, figuring for fish they only had to travel a few inches. He had no string, and that threw him until he looked down. Make a prediction. What do you think he sees when he looks down that is like 
string. He saw his tennis shoes. They had long laces, too long. And he found that one lace cut in half would take care of both his shoes. And that left him with one other lace for a bowstring. All seemed to be going well until he tried a test shot. He put an arrow to the string, pulled it back to his cheek, pointed it at the dirt, and at that precise instant, the bow wood exploded in his hands, sending splinters and chips of wood into his face. Two pieces actually stuck into his forehead just above his eyes. And they had only been, if they had only been slightly lower, they would have blinded him. Two stiff mistakes. In his mental journal, he listed them to his father. He listed all of the mistakes. He had made a new bow with slender limbs and a more fluid, gentle pull. So when he pulled on it, it was, was able to bend better. But he could not hit the fish, though he sat in the water and was, in the end, surrounded by a virtual cloud of small fish. It was infuriating. He would pull the bow back, set the arrow just above the water, and when the fish was no more than an inch away, he would release the arrow, only to miss. It seemed to him that the arrow had gone right through the fish, again and again. But the fish didn't get hurt. Finally, after hours, he stuck the arrow down in the water, pulled the bow, and waited for the fish to come close. And while he was waiting... He noticed that the water seemed to make the arrow bend or break in the middle. I'm not sure if you have talked about refraction in science yet. I know you do talk about it this year. But at this point, Brian realizes what he's doing wrong. Of course, he had forgotten that water refracts, bends light. He had learned that somewhere, in some class. Maybe it was in Miss Morgan's science class. He couldn't remember. But it did bend light, and that meant the fish were not where they appeared to be. They were lower, just below, which meant he had to aim just under them. He would not forget his first hit. Not ever. A rounded shaped fish with golden sides, sides as gold as the sun, simile, stopped in front of the arrow and he aimed just beneath it at the bottom edge of the fish and released the arrow and there was a bright flurry, a splash of gold in the water. He grabbed the arrow and raised it up, and the fish was on the end, wiggling against the blue sky. He held the fish against the sky until it stopped wiggling, held it, and looked to the sky and felt his throat tighten, swell, and fill with pride at what he had done. He had done food. He has finally figured out how to catch a fish.